uh, which brings us to our three heavy hitters here uh, on the stage. So we have uh, Bev Murray with Berkshire Hathaway. And you know what? I'm just going to kind of change it a little bit and make I'll have each person kind of give a little intro. I know you guys received the flyers, but if you're like me, you maybe didn't read it. You just looked at the photos. So I'll let everyone kind of give a little spiel of not just what they do, but also why we're talking about the Gulf Coast of Florida in particular, because what we're going to talk about applies to the investment journey for anywhere. Uh, but particularly the Gulf Coast of Florida is uh, a hot market, has been for a long time. Um, the state in particular, built on tourism, that's the lifeblood of the, of the state. So having each one of you maybe kind of just give a little spiel on, you know, from your perspective, why, why here, why now, and all that. So Bev? Sure. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bev Murray. I'm with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services here in Sarasota. Uh, I have been here since 1999, so 25 years this year. We moved from London, um, and basically I got my real estate license as soon as we got off the boat. Um, I had, really had nothing going for me other than my accent, because I didn't know anything about anything. Um, but I found people very warm and welcoming and willing to uh, take a chance on a, a young realtor with Michael Saunders. Um, so from Michael Saunders, I ended up um, opening my own brokerage, had that for about 12 years. And then in 2017, I joined Berkshire Hathaway because it had really become obvious to me that um, we, I needed to have a powerhouse brand behind me to get the um, exposure for my clients and my listings and everything. So um, that's where I am currently. Um, we, this whole thing came about because um, I personally like to um, deal with all kinds of real estate. I do have a lot of high-end clients, but I also like to get first-time home buyers their home. Um, but, you know, we have a big second home market here. Um, and I felt, we all felt actually, there's a gap in the market in terms of people having the knowledge base and the, the points of contact for the important people and the important services that they need. So that's why we put all this together. Um, I'm sure really for most of you, we, we don't need to, I don't need to kind of sell Sarasota to you. Um, but I, I think it's worth noting that, you know, we have become in the last few years, um, you know, Sarasota is firmly on the map. We are a phenomenal small city. We're no longer the, the poor cousins of Naples. Um, we, you know, and our values now reflect that, um, that we are perceived to be a, a player in the Florida second home market. Um, we get, you know, not only do we have people attracted to the beaches, uh, but we have a huge um, source of income and for vacation rental um, expenditure on sports tourism with um, Benson, Nathan Benson Park, the rowing, um, Premier Sports Campus, IMG. So there, there are a lot of reasons that people are coming here for short-term vacations. So therefore it's a, you know, a great opportunity for people to, if they're considering purchasing or investing in a second home that they can make money on. Uh, thank you. I know, uh... I think let's do it geographically. So you came here via London. How about we do our next one from New York, right? So we, she's still like a Florida native, basically. So Joanne, you know, give us your spiel. Thank you. I'm Joanne Koontz. I am an attorney and CPA. And the chief reason I lobbied to have an insurance person here is that there would be a topic more boring than mine. Because um, <laughs> I need the help wherever I can get it. Um, I have been here... 19 years going on 20 and I literally came the day after graduation from law school because I realized that my husband was from Ohio and I couldn't live there and I wanted to move back to New York and he couldn't live there so I was like the old people are onto something we should move to Florida while we still look good in swimsuits <laughs> that's how we ended up here that's a that's a good decision yeah and I was like somewhere between Tampa and Naples uh, north of Tampa is Alabama the East Coast is what I left that I couldn't take him back to, so we really didn't have any choice, and we stumbled into Sarasota. My first law firm was immediately behind the cheetah. So you can see why I was, you know, love at first sight. 
then I found downtown and the beaches, yeah. and it was much it's, better. It, it is, it is uh, hard to beat that. <laughs> and then I don't want to be too biased here, but um, probably my favorite person on the podium, she so happens to be my CEO and boss as well, uh, Heather Van Wee. Hi. Hi, my name is Heather Van Wee. I am the president and CEO of the Cottages on the Key and also the Compass Collection. Um, my business was started out of pure necessity. Uh, it started out of the housing crisis of 2008. I initially had a renovation and construction company, which died definitely during that time frame. And um, I had to recreate myself and try and save my home. And in doing so, I created a business methodology that allowed for short-term vacation rentals for Siesta Key in Sarasota. Um, it was not very well known back then. It was very avant-garde in 2009 to be renting your house out to strangers. Airbnb wasn't actually even in the US at that point. So um, yeah, that's how we got started. And we have been growing organically uh, since then for the last 15 years. Um, the, that's my, 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 my history. Um, I can tell you right now, the cottages on the key um, outperforms every other vacation rental management company by about 10 to 15 percent uh, on the barrier islands and in the mainland of Sarasota. Uh, we will generate about 8 to 12 percent of an increase in revenue year over year for our owners. And we currently uh, manage a portfolio of about 15 million for 80 owners. So that kind of gives you a breakdown of our standards. Um, we're a luxury, luxury vacation rental company, and that's our niche, and that's what we stay in our lane for. And um, I would definitely tell you that you're in the right place if you're interested in having a vacation rental uh, home and investing in it. Uh, the way to go, and I'm quite biased, I know, but I definitely have uh, some statistics that will show that a professionally managed vacation rental home will earn 30% more revenue annually than a self-managed home. So uh, this entire discussion is going to wrap and entail what that takes and, um, and, and what you will have to endure to get to that point, but it'll be worth it. Oh, yeah. And I take uh, great pride in that. You know, our company over 300 reviews, 4.9 star on Google. You can't you can't cheat that, right? So it takes a lot of effort um, and execution, and the culmination of these three on stage and, and our our different connections and great uh, professional rapports makes this a nice uh, one stop shop for that whole vacation rental process. So when we're talking about that process. There's really you know, four components, I think, of the investment home journey that we, that we wanted to touch on and, and let you guys share your expertise. And I think the first one is something we all naturally do, even passively, uh, which is the search. I know just between my Instagram and uh, my emails and my TikTok, there's a lot of algorithms that know that I'm always looking at investment homes and I end up like just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So I think the search is probably the best part to start, or the best uh, best person to start with that would probably be Bev, just because, you know, you're the realtor. <laughs> right, so uh, yeah, we've all, Zillow is a blessing and a curse, really. Um, I think there are good things about it, but what is really evident to me is there's a lot of information and data missing on that. So. Uh, and, and when it comes to searching specifically for an investment property, you, there is data that you need that you just can't get. Um, so my role really is to save uh, people time and hassle and you know, late nights when they should be asleep, scrolling. And um, basically just trying to find, um, first of all, the properties that fit the criteria. Uh, the first criteria in real estate obviously is location, but actually equally important is uh, mun municipal coding. So you will find, particularly on um, say Siesta Key, you'll find homes like 300 yards from each other that have completely different rules and, and um, eligibility for renting out. Obviously, you know, if you can get something that's a minimum of three nights, that could potentially earn you much more than something that's a month or you know, a week. So we would, you know, based on criteria, I'm going to be looking for properties that are on market, 
but equally off market that would make good, in the right zones in the right areas that would make potential good uh, investments and um, you know, yeah, an obvious place to start is, is a listing that is already rented out. Um, and we would look at that and you, you would take the revenue projection, which I can guarantee is not going to be as um, perhaps trustworthy and uh, detailed as something that is, the cottages and key is going to come up with. But what we do is we'd look at that and say, okay, well, this seems to be a decent performing rental. Uh, and but what can we do to make it better, make it into an outstanding performing um, rental? And that could be things like, well, you know, it needs the outdoor space needs to be enhanced. You could put in a putting green or a tiki hut, or perhaps you need to install a little area where people can work from home. So we would look at that, and I say we because you know it's me doing the grunt work on the searching, but everything that I do is in conjunction with Heather's team because Heather has the data. She can provide me with, if I go, hey, what about this house here? I want to approach the owner. And she'll be like, yeah, here's exactly the parameters. This is what the anticipated rental income will be. Uh, this is what you would, this is, if you made these enhancements, this is what it would, um, you know, this is, this, this is what it would perform at. So um, basically that's, you know, where I work in conjunction with Heather's team. And uh, before before I let you respond to that, I, w I will say, like even on a professional level right now, uh, me and Bever are have been in communication on on a home that is you know potentially coming on the market, and I'm helping provide her information on that. So you know, our company not being a realtor makes it an extra asset for different people of interest who are who are trying to find that information. So I know you talked about zoning and location and location, and then also location as important aspects. Uh, for for it, but you know, Heather, when you're when you're doing that search process, what are you what are you bringing to the table? Well, I mean, before I even get started on what I bring to the table, I think we have to reverse. We have to go in reverse because the very first step that every single investor should take, and if you're not doing it right now, you need to go in reverse. Is talk about what Joanne can offer um, in the way of tax strategy, financial planning. That's, that's the first thing that needs to be talked about. And then I think I would like to talk about my portion because you, don't, you, you won't even get to me until you go through these two lovely ladies. Um, so Joanne, you gotta take it. Well, um, the the uh, wonderful on, thing on about one second, this. Joanne, are you, you okay? Oh, don't, don't steal the thunder here. <laughs> no, no. Come on up. There's write-offs? What? But not just the common stuff you see in the code. The stuff that you know in the business you can write off. Yeah, ab absolutely. absolutely. What he's saying is I'm Italian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't show for my name, but, you know. Um, no. So the, the interesting thing about the planning piece is I'm, I'm no one is scrolling my website late at night like there's nothing super sexy about legal and tax and um, someone actually one of my clients this evening said why are you both and I said I just standardized test well like you know there's, <laughs> it's, there's really not like something you do on purpose but here we are so <clears throat> that being said everything that we can accomplish you know you can have the best search and you can buy the best property and get it at the best price but if we pay less tax that's like never, it doesn't matter how good of a job you do, less tax is always a great idea. I find that frequently my role seems to be that of Katie Couric, where I just give the news. And I'm like, well, here's how much tax there is. Whereas if we could get involved and plan ahead of time, when you started scrolling, like first stay up all night scrolling and then call me tomorrow, uh, that gives you the most runway to make the plan. And the plan can be Tax planning, the plan can be asset protection, the plan can be legal entity structure. So should I be an LLC? Should it be in a trust? Should the trust own the LLC? Do I need a 1031 exchange? Uh, these things, people start flying at me and it's usually while they're under contract. So I sign the house, I sign the contract, I'm buying the condo and now it's a mad scramble to figure out the structure and the tax. And that's 
doable, it's just not ideal. So if I could say, well, let's look at something like this, or, oh, you're buying something short term and you're gonna have a bunch of them, maybe you qualify for real estate professional designation and here's what you have to do to get that and here's what it looks like. But if your mind is already at home inspection and what the kitchen looks like in the damn tiki bar, I don't know, there's so much talk about a tiki bar, I don't even have one. Um, then it's really hard to focus on these things because what I have is ministerial and mundane and horrible to discuss, but it's crucial to the plan. So the earlier we do it, the more effective it is and the more reason there was to endure it. So eat your vegetables first. Right. And then, and then the brownie. I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's and not the, that hard. But. So brownie. I'm the brownie. <laughs> vegetables eaten. So now we get to talk about dessert, the fun, the, the revenue side. All the fun. Never Friday. Everybody loves to talk about vacations, right? Okay. So the savvy investor has discovered the area. Okay. That's uh, who, 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 yeah, who, who can say no to that? Um, they have discovered Joanne. They have done their financial planning, their tax implications, strategies. You know, they've, they've done all that. They've met Bev, and they've gotten off of the Zillow scrolling, and now they've gotten more focused because they know exactly what they need. They know how it's going to affect, affect their bottom line, and they know how that it's going to affect them personally. What they want to achieve, both personally and financially, is just as important. Um, you can't take one without the other. Bev now knows exactly what you're looking for. So take away the doom scrolling and put Bev on top of it. She's going to sit there and tell you exactly what you need because she's already worked with us a million times over. She knows exactly what to do. And she's going to narrow down your search. She's going to niche you out to your perfect stay in the lane places that you need to go. Um, that's going to make Joanne happy, make you happy. And then she's going to go ahead and um, bring me uh, an investor that has met criteria. And then what I do is I take that criteria and let's say she's narrowed it down to about three or four different properties. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to say, okay, what are your wants and what are your needs? And what are we dealing with in the sense of the criteria that is available to us? So... Um, I'm going to marry all of those together, and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to say, what are the zoning issues, what are the location issues, and what are the amenities issues? And how we can make that as, uh, as revenue-producing top end as possible. And then that's when we get to the really good stuff, where we're going to give you a revenue projection on each of those homes. And then you can make a personal decision. That personal decision is going to be based on what your family wants, what you personally need financially, um, what Joanne su suggests to you based on your current portfolio of assets um, and investments. So. Um, I will get a little bit deeper into that, actually. I don't want to go too far because we actually have case studies that I'm going to present at the end of our, our discussion um, right before Q&A. So I'll give you some examples, and actually Matt will be able to do it better because he can see and I can't because you guys. <laughs> but, but yeah, so anyway, um, that's kind of like the part of the searching process of this journey, of this four-part journey. All right, awesome. So you can be you know, just a spreadsheet buyer that's looking at purely the numbers. You're buying one home, two homes, 10 homes. You want to use it half the year. You're putting together your plan with this crew. Uh, and then the, I guess the fun part is happening. You're purchasing the home. So if you're purchasing the home, I guess, Heather, you talked about the revenue generation. Um, what, are we, what are we seeing in terms of, you know, making that come to reality? Okay, so during the purchasing process, um, we're going to generate those revenue forecasts that I was telling you about. You're going to make your decision, and then you're going to go for contract with Bev. Um, what we're going to want to look at is, does that property already have rental history? If it does, um, we're going to use that during our forecasting period. If, it, if it's new to the market, we're also going to use historical representations from our own portfolio. And we have 15 years, and I guarantee you that there's not a single home that I haven't had on my portfolio that wouldn't represent what we're trying to accomplish here for our investors, right? Um, I have a lot of history, so 95% of all my revenue projections are right on target. 
Um, accurate projections are definitely going to help you in the mortgage lending process. Um, they, t they actually heed that, um, especially when it's from a large scale you know, professional management group. Um, we're also going to provide estimates for costs associated with asset pres preservation. That's going to be important for you to know because, I mean, what we're going to focus on is your bottom line. That's not necessarily what you need in order to, you know, purchase the property or go for lending or whatnot. But that's what you personally should have. You should understand that, and Joanne's going to want to know that as well. Um, the other thing is, is we're going to want to know about amenities. So when it comes to vacation rentals, uh, amenities are king, especially since the pandemic. Having a tiki bar and a putting green and a fire, you know, like a fire pit and all these things. These are these are the these are the differentiators between you and the next guy. They don't cost that much. You're going to get your money back, um, and we can actually do an analysis of how soon you will return that money back to you. And later on, we'll talk about how that helps in your appraised value when you go to exit. Um, and then more importantly is you're going to fall in love with the home and it's not going to be perfect because you fall in love with people and they're not perfect, but you still accept them, right? So you're going to fall in love with the home. It's not perfect. And you're probably going to want to do something to make it perfect, more perfect for you. Um, the other thing is we as a property management group at the cottages are definitely going to also fall in love with your home, but we're also going to know like an, a, an additional room is going to add this much more cash flow value to you as a, as rental income. So we're going to say to you, hey, this is a good idea. This is what you should do. So it's also good for us during the purchase process, not after. Remember, we're trying to be proactive, not reactive here, right? So prior to purchasing, you definitely want to know how much those uh, construction and renovation costs are going to set you back and how soon you will recoup your money. So again, the Cottages on the Key works very heavily with Murray Homes. They are actually here right now. They are the ones that can provide that estimate for us right up front. And uh, trust me when I say they're very, very exact in their um, costs. So it's, it's a solid number to, to rely on. So here's the thing. Before you've even gone, you're, you're in your contingency period. You haven't gone into contract total contract, right? You've, you're a savvy buyer. You've got everything lined up. You know exactly what's, what it's going to cost you. You go back to Joanne, you tell her all of this and you say, and she says, yes, it pencils out, right? That's what you want. And you want a five or 10 year plan. Yeah. Goodbye. Yes. <laughs> so whatever I said was, he's mad about the, yeah. mad about yeah. the tiki bar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone gets mad about tiki huts. I would, I would say uh, that was very thorough. So when you're looking at that, you know, that information, capital improvement, all that kind of stuff, that's probably a useful tool for Bev when you're coming to the negotiation table or, you know, being boots on the ground, you know, because right now we're talking about boots on the ground services to, to this prospective homeowner, right? So what's it look like on the actual purchase transaction side? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's fairly straightforward. You've all purchased property before, but um, I think the focus, well, the first thing to say is that you don't need to be here for the process at all. Um, the beauty of FaceTime and WhatsApp video is that, you know, I've been able, and particularly through the pandemic, was able to help people buy and sell um, big and small properties um, via FaceTime. Uh, because, you know, I can go around and open whatever drawers you like, you know. Um, so that, you, everything can be done digitally. So you don't need to be here. You can be involved or you don't have to be involved. It depends whether it's a, an emotional purchase that you're going to use or whether it's purely for investment purposes. But really, like with any purchase, my focus is to try and get the very best possible deal uh, in any given market. So, um, and one of the ways that I, there's two ways that I do it. One is obviously we um, inspect the, 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 it completely, basically. We rely on those inspections to bring up a whole raft of 
important and non-important deficiencies that we then use to, to negotiate. Because ultimately, if I can get you $20,000 off for something that's really pretty much cosmetic, but because we've hammered away, um, they'll more likely to give it up. Um, that's, that's your tiki hut, right? <laughs> um, and the other thing as well that I use cottages in the key for is um, if we have a rental property, a property that's already in a rental program, well, I'll use them and their expertise to pick holes in their revenue calculations to, and then I'll just say well you know you say that it's you know this this is not adding up for us we, we it won't work with these numbers you know we need to come down that kind of thing so well, that's good teamwork which which brings us to Joanne you know we've, we've planned we've done all the boring stuff and you went from you know insurance to probably working with I imagine the lenders and stuff at this point right yeah, so ideally we'd like to have a look at the contract before you sign it. That's also aspirational and doesn't always happen. Interestingly enough, um, you opened with maybe people didn't read the um, bios, but I would submit to you that often they haven't read the real estate contract that's already been signed. Um, DocuSign is a blessing and a curse, man. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, uh, ideally we would review the contract before it's executed. Um, the contingencies are important, particularly if there is any question with due diligence with respect to um, zoning or what is permissible or what is, you know, you can add the Tiki Hut, but will you get the zoning and, and building permission to do so? Um, so sometimes there's those types of investigations that are beyond the typical uh, home inspection. Um, if you need time to create that LLC or trust or update it or find it, um, now is the time to be looking for that once we're under contract. What we don't want to do is put our friends the lender and our friends the insurance agent um, behind the eight ball where they're having to catch up because you tell them two weeks before closing that you intend to take title in an LLC and they've done all their underwriting in your individual name. Um, that can cause problems with meeting the deadlines which can jeopardize uh, earnest money deposits or um, the contract in general. So there's a lot of that kind of heavy leg work that happens on the front end. We also handle the closing. We pull the title commitment. We do the search. We look to see what types of liens affect the property, what needs to be resolved so that you don't have a problem at the time you purchase, you don't have a problem while you own it, and you don't have any problems when you sell it. Um, that is certainly something that everyone expects to go without any issues. Um, when I find an issue, um, it's it's Usually, this is not open heart surgery, so the good news is no one dies. Um, it's usually a variance or some other legal document that we need to fix whatever the problem is in the public record. But oftentimes, those things take time. So avoiding delay saves money. People have not um, invested in alternate housing or whatever the case may be if, if we can get ahead of these kind of delays. If we need time to execute 1031 exchanges and onboard qualified intermediaries, whatever it is that is the sophisticated part of the transaction for you is completely doable and just requires some time. So the sooner that we get out ahead of that and notify the people that need to be on the team, the more efficiently we can do that with the least amount of stress. Um, and that way we are meeting our deadlines and not um, having any additional costs incurred. No, that's great. That's, uh, I mean, that's the whole point of why we're here, right? Enough prep work, talking yes. to the experts, it saves us a lot of great Talking hairs. to the experts also helps because a lot of my friends are from other places and I frequently hear the statement, that's not how we do it back in, insert high tax, poor weather state you came from. <laughs> <laughs> So um, just like you don't have to shovel the snow like you did in New Jersey, you also don't close on a house the same way. So uh, a lot of the procedural things are different. They're unfamiliar and people do have a tendency to come in with the biases of their experience. And if this is the first time you've done it or the first time you've done it in a while, um, things have changed. Amen. So you've got the purchase handled. Yes. Uh, now we're getting to I guess the long game of it, no matter what your plan is, typically they're, you know, three, five, ten, cradle to grave type of plans, it depends on the, the person. Um, we're looking at the hold, and I think the hold is really probably your meat and potato, Heather. We're talking about, you know, revenue and the property itself. So, yeah, so um, from our perspective, um, 
it's pretty it's it's our responsibility to make sure that during your hold period um, that you hold it as long as possible because that's very good for us but um, <laughs> but actually no I mean it, it's um, it's basically two main components um, it's going to be revenue generation and asset preservation so those are the two uh, most concerning issues during your hold period uh, for your management group to take care of. Um, so we focus on increasing revenue year over year. Um, we push for 12% increases. So we want to make sure that your cash flow evolves along with um, the home itself over time. Um, that's, you know, that that's Dependent upon the type of property and the usage of that property depends on how often you want to use it. Sometimes that changes over the year. Sometimes one year you never use it. The next year you have, you know, 14 weeks that you want to use. And that's just, that's your own personal needs. Um, and, and we just kind of work through that, you know. That, that, re that revenue year over year is, as I was saying before, 8 to 12% typically. So um, the other thing is we want to operationally manage your home. We want to make sure that uh, from an asset preservation standpoint that the home will continue to appraise at the rate that it should. And that means that we have to take care of it from the foundation to the rooftop and everything in between. A professionally uh, managed home will definitely appraise along and along much better than a home that is not professionally managed. Unless, of course, you live in it yourself. Because all of you probably have primary residences and you know what it takes to manage your own homes. Um, and you know being there is what matters the most, right? I mean, actually being present. Um, when you're not capable of being present, who do you rely on? Uh, you, you can rely on... Um, you know, a couple of people here and there, but honestly, you need people who have the resources and the connections and the actual sophistication to understand what a home takes. Anything from a condo complex to a mansion, okay? So um, they need to have that kind of sophistication. Um, Another thing that is very important from asset preservation, but also from revenue generation, and therefore its appraised value year over year, is managing guest expectations. And I know that sounds kind of crazy to say that, but if you manage the guest expectations while they're in the home, you have what's on your hands is gold. Guest retention is gold. They will pay more for your home year over year because they know that you're taking very good care of it and then you're offering them these little nuggets of uh, wonderful value year over year, right? So you're gonna continue to put more value into your home, you're gonna update it, you're gonna care for it, and so those guests are gonna return. Um, our guest retention um, average is actually 35% across our entire portfolio. That is extremely healthy, and uh, we do everything to maintain that. The most important thing, maybe, from Joanne's perspective, though, is what we call trust accounting. So trust accounting is a type of accounting methodology that is not required in the state of Florida. Not many managers, professional vacation rental managers, actually do uh, trust accounting. But in other states in the US, it is required. And now it's kind of like a, it's a sign of good um, reputation and due diligence to actually perform this regardless of what state that you're in. So you want to make sure that um, the person that you're doing business with can offer trust accounting. This matters most over a 5, 10, 15 year holding period. And trust accounting means everything is transparent, it's open, it's reported and you can have a historical review uh, of extreme detail. We do trust accounting at the Cottages on the Key. I don't believe that there's another company that can say that in this area. Um, but when you go back, and this is going all the way back to your ROI and the reasons why you started this from the very beginning, uh, Joanne is going to be able to take this, these accounting details year after year she, and her company is going to be able to make a lot more sense of it. She's going to have more access to details that will allow for her to give you what you need as your exit strategy becomes 
a situation, right? Where, where eventually all, thing, all good things end, um, and you need to make sure that if your good thing ends, you end it on the right note, or you turn it over to your children, and it's a, it's a legacy situation at that point. So you got uh, the fun part that, you know, Joanne gets to actually do. <laughs> Instead of the boring legal stuff, you're going to talk about write-offs and all that, huh? That's just it. So the, again, it's back to the plan. If we know what's going on, we can help advise how we'll categorize these things. I'm not saying don't buy the Tiki Bar. I'm saying how we depreciate it, whether we expense it. Are we going to take bonus depreciation? All these things are going to affect not only this year's tax return, but we're looking at the tax planning for the ultimate sale. How do these things affect your basis? Are we doing a 1031 exchange? Um, with that information, um, not only do we have the ability to plan, we also have the ability to save money because everything is in one place. Um, the more you are organized and the more everything is centralized in terms of the um, accounting, the more deductions we take, the less tax you pay. Because shockingly, I don't live with you all years. So I don't know what you spent the money on. And um, it's, it's, it's an issue of deductibility. If it's not there, we don't know to take it off the return. It also contributes to um, liability protection. When we have commingling and you're paying from stuff from different accounts, if, whether we have the rental property in an LLC, if we do, we need to be paying for those expenses out of the LLC bank account. Um, if we're not and things are here, there, and everywhere, Morgan and Morgan, for the other people, are going to say, ah, oh, you're commingling. I can't tell the difference between you and the business. You shouldn't be protected like a business. And therefore, we're going to pierce the veil and get inside the company and now attach to the property. So it's, it is <clears throat> on several levels such a, an aggregating um, contribution to the financial and legal st safety and stability and profitability of the, company, of, of the property. Yeah, it's a really cool combination of, you know, revenue earned, yeah. expenses, how do you protect yourself, make it best. And all in the while, Bev's on, on the side here with her crystal ball, knowing exactly how it's <laughs> going to appreciate and all of that, right? Right, Bev? Yeah, I wish. I wish. Um, so, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, what I would be focused on along the journey is, you know, market, general market updates. Um, I do not have a crystal ball, otherwise I'd be very, very wealthy. But I have a generally good idea about what's going on. Um, but, you know, out of interest when I was preparing for this, um, I looked at the appreciation rates for million dollar plus single family homes on the barrier islands as opposed to the mainland. And um, for, for the five years prior to now, the... Um, appreciation, the increase in value on, for homes on the barrier islands is 27%. On the mainland, it is 7%. So you can reasonably expect that, it, obviously we had a, you know, we had the pandemic, the values jumped hugely, but actually for Siesta Key, that figure over 10 years is 20% increase in value. So um, you are in possession of an asset that will, given all things being equal, appreciate over time, and it's gonna appreciate better on the Keys than it is on the mainland, because everybody wants to be at the beach. So, so homes appreciate better on the island, and they pay more to rent there on the island? Okay. It's a pretty, pretty good combo there. So you have, uh, so you have the purchase, you've held it for X amount of years, then, then what? We have our exit, right? So, you know, Bev, you just talked about the appreciation. Yeah. That's the, you know, the benefit. What, uh, what costs? I know there's a lot going on with different real estate commissions, so yep. maybe you can do this for free and just tell us exactly the costs associated. Yeah, so you may have heard that there's an issue with uh, real estate commissions generally. It's a topic I could go into for another hour and happy to chat to anybody afterwards. But ultimately at this point in time, we don't know what will actually happen. I think it's reasonable to expect that, uh, I don't think you're suddenly going to not be paying real estate commissions. I, I don't know any realtors who are gonna be working for free. Um, but the other thing is as well, I, I, I think that there are so many factors which I won't go into now, but I think let's say if you are paying, five to six percent 
for professional fees um, uh, when you're selling, I would say perhaps to, I would still factor that in, that, uh, the, that amount in, perhaps over time it'll decrease slightly, but um, I, I wouldn't go kind of, you know, whooping and hollering just yet because we, you know, well, you have to create the demand and all that kind of stuff for your property. I also add in about another percentage point for miscellaneous closing costs, which Joanne would obviously give you to the, to the dime. Um, the one thing I would say, though, about uh, the exit and lumping in with the general appreciation of your location is going to be buyers want well-maintained, um, good-looking homes, and they will pay a premium for them. So not only are you then going to be having a, another potential uh, investor come in and purchase your unit, which we have all of the financials for in great detail, which will be superior to anybody else out there. Um, but you're also going to attract buyers who want to use it for themselves because they can just move right in. Um, so th there's a sort of little double edge to that, um, to that um, asset uh, increase. Um, and there was one more thing, but it's totally escaped me. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have uh, if you have a turnkey home, oh, you remember it. I know what it okay. was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was the fact that actually your, um, you know, we saved you some money, hopefully, so you can put. I'm going to use the tiki hut again. Put your tiki hut in. You will get the benefit of that again on the outset. On the outset as well. So all yeah, those little amenities. Add, add up to the dollar value. Yeah, it's turnkey, you know, less less barriers for the for the buyer, right? Okay. So it's kept up well. So Joanne, she's talking about dock stamps and probably, I don't know, 1031 or something. Do your stuff. Okay. <laughs> Numbers, numbers. Yeah, so when it comes to the, um, to the cost of the sale, we have to look at the closing costs that you're going to pay at the table, and then we have to look at the tax implications. So you are going to pay documentary stamp taxes typically. Um, it is customary that the seller would pay those on the sales price. It's $7 per thousand of sale price. So if it's a million dollar home, it's $7,000 in doc stamps. That is a fee to the state. We don't have state income tax. That's how you have roads and cops. Um, so that's not going anywhere. Uh, other expenses are negotiable. Frankly, doc stamps are negotiable. Sometimes we throw those back on the buyer if we get a higher price. There's sometimes tax reasons to be creative with, with those things that affect basis. Um, again, all much easier to do with, with time. Um, in, with respect to the taxes, if we're doing a 1031 exchange, the fees for the qualified intermediary to serve in that capacity are not outrageous in a forward exchange you're usually looking at around fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars a reverse exchange where you're buying the um you're you're buying the replacement property first before you sell those are more like five to six thousand dollars for those fees but otherwise um the doc stamps are the big the big issue the big ticket uh, outside of commission on the closing statement with respect to the taxes the capital gains if you've held it for more than a year are going to be long term. They're going to be taxed a portion at zero, a portion at 15, and if you get high enough, a, a portion at 20%. That's a flat rate. Um, if you've held it for less than a year, uh, that's going to be ordinary income rate, which is going to be your regular tax rate. So sometimes we do need to be creative. Uh, you don't want to pass up a, a good deal. If, you've, if you're getting a number that is a crazy number and it's less than a year, we might want to run some scenarios to say, Maybe we go under contract now and set the closing date out a bit. We can look at planning with installment payments and things like that to help assuage the taxes. But um, you know, that being said, it's time's the key, and um, a good bit of that planning can be done back up at the search standpoint. It doesn't have to be done as we're looking at closing. We can say, "I'm going to hold this property until I hit X as my goal, and then I'm going to cash out." Or until I'm X years old or until I'm ready to move or whatever the triggers are. Um, frequently, a, a fair amount of those scenarios can be forecast before you even finalize which property you're gonna purchase. That helps keep the emotion out and keep the business in. Um, the people who are buying on the ROI are, are typically more uh, akin to that rather than the folks who are saying, you know, I'm buying this as a, basically an IRA I can use. I wanna crash at the beach a little bit. I'd like somebody else to pay the mortgage payment and watch it go up in value. There's nothing wrong with I, any of these approaches, but they're all different. And so sometimes we do see folks have competing 
goals and objectives, and in order to meet them all the best, uh, we need to, to have those kind of clearly identified. But um, with respect to you know the other closing costs, nothing else is material in in terms of you know hundred dollars for a well two fifty now for a uh, municipal or for a estoppel letter from the association those kind of things. Yeah, so I know for uh, even in our experience, Heather, with uh, some other homes that have been sold under our management and transition of ownership, the uh, the guests you know the future bookings, the instant equity per se. That's involved with that. What's um, what's the property manager working with on the realtor with that? Yeah. So that that yeah. So that can uh, m make certain sellers hesitate when they're in their exit mode. Um, they might be a little cautious when it comes to that, thinking that they are dividing um, a potential uh, buyer pool um, from one that is an investor who really does want rental income versus a, an end user or an end resident person. Um, but in most cases, I mean, over the last 15 years, I can just give you my my personal um, uh, situations that I've, I've endured uh, with my clients. Um, most of the time, pr the property that you have bought, for your reasons, also, it, 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 it attracts the same like-minded type of buyer. So um, your strategies are aligned already kind of to begin with. Um, in the case that they're not, I mean, honestly, uh, when it comes to rental revenue, proven track record of rental revenue is always more enticing and provides more value, um, even though an end user may not prefer to rent it, they still know that having past revenue means value in their home. Um, most of the time, uh, if someone wants to purchase a property from you as the seller and they do not want future reservations on the book, there is a transition period that most people are willing to go through and uh, more scenarios can come to pass. Some of those um, scenarios uh, can be dictated based on the real estate closing deal and um, it is between buyer and seller. I would say that um, there are a multitude of different scenarios for that. And uh, we actually have a master lease that we hold with the, with the owner of the property um, that spells all that out and makes it very clean and simple and um, gives many options. So if anyone is interested in seeing that, I can definitely offer that to you. I can talk you through that. Um, I would just, I would say, Nine out of 10 times, the fact that um, someone wants to purchase your house and they are gonna be an end resident, end user, uh, don't, has, don't make that hesitate, don't, don't let you hesitate because of that, because um, your ultimate goal was to achieve the ROI in the end for yourself. The rest of the deal can be worked out. It can be worked out and you can figure that out. You know, your, your exit strategy can definitely be figured out. Um, strategically, financially, through that through that prepping from the search stage. So, no, I I, I love that. So it's uh, all encompassing. I think you mentioned you had uh, some some examples that we were going to share just to uh, kind of go over. I'll give I'll give kind of the rundown on that. The, yes, you're um, going to have to help me because I can't yeah, see. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I can see and I and I know the home. So you know this first home that you're seeing is an example of zoning making the difference on. Um, Revenue. So this home here uh, had a full exterior renovation. Uh, we gave them a whole game plan. Our operations manager, our marketing director, our revenue team said, "Hey, take this hardscaped home, add a putting green, a fire pit, you know, do a new uh, pool deck. All of these things that they added in. No tiki hut, but it does have a putting green. All, all of these things went. Took this home from making about seventy thousand to making about a." closing out last year at just over $100,000 of rental revenue. So when you talk about return on investment, that is a, for a monthly home to increase 40%, that's outstanding. Uh, already has a huge following. That's a four bedroom home, but not 500 yards away like you were saying, Bev, we have another four bedroom home that the zoning makes all the difference. So this home coming up that's about to be shown is uh, 
just around the corner from the first one. It's a single family home as well. It's four bedrooms, two and a half baths, so it's not even as many bathrooms. Um, just a pool, no putting green, but it's zoned weekly. And this home was self-managed. So not only did it increase uh, naturally from being with a professional manager, um, it's also zoned weekly. So the amount of turn you can get, someone willing to pay uh, $1,000 a night for one week is much higher than someone willing to pay $1,000 a night for a month. So getting that many guests that are willing to pay a thousand bucks a night for a week and then another one, then another one, then another one, you see here it goes from about 170,000 of rental revenue to about 240,000 of rental revenue that it earned last year and is on track to make again this year. So both of these homes went through renovation um, on the interior or the exterior, went to professional managers um, and are just benefiting drastically from that and that's from utilizing you know in fact uh the mortgage group Braun mortgage group was there for for the lending for this property uh actually so they can tell you about that as well the, these homes both on the barrier island i'm sure are appreciated which bev can i'm sure look up and give you the the comps and the estimates on that and then uh you know joanne her expertise talking about you know oh these investments are going to be deducted this way and that so this, those are just two examples of many that we could talk about, but we still have about 10 minutes left, so I wanted, before we get a few more drinks and things, so I wanted to open this up to uh, any questions, if anyone has any questions on anything.